Welcome, University of Chicago alumni, parents, and friends to the 2014 Colorado Harper Lecture. My name is Wendy Chi, and I graduated from the college in 1998. As president of the Alumni Club of Colorado, we want to thank you for participating in tonight's Harper Lecture. We're glad you've chosen to embrace this chance to connect with university faculty in our community. I encourage you to seek out other opportunities to extend the life of your mind, whether it be attending uncommon course sessions during alumni weekend or taking part in webcast lectures offered on UChicago Live. Last year, the Alumni Club of Colorado and the Military Affinity Group were highlighted during the Alumni Weekend Award Ceremony. Paul Yingling from Colorado Springs won a 2013 Public Service Award. The Alumni Awards are presented annually and are a great way to recognize UChicago alumni worldwide. Of course, tonight's event is just one example of the many programmatic opportunities our club offers. No matter where your interests lie, we hope you find this community to be a meaningful resource and that it provides you an enduring connection to the university. As you might know, our club supports the 3,000 alumni, parents, and friends across the Denver region. The commitment made by us to by, made by us all to the advancement of the university is vital to its continued success. We have recently established a volunteer board of directors to expand our alumni programming and communications. Thank you to John Dwyer and Glenn Iverson for partnering with me to bring alumni programming to Colorado. All events stem from alumni, from alumni volunteer ideas and efforts. Thank you all attending who have contributed. As a community, more than 150 of you have attended events in the past year. Thank you for your participation. And now I am pleased to introduce Emily Teeter. Emily is an alumna of the university, earning her PhD in 1990 from the Humanities Division. She is an Egyptologist and research associate at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. Moving between the OI basement and the university's field mission in Luxor, she enjoys deci deciphering the clues on artifacts using the entire hieroglyphic la language system. Please join me in welcoming Emily Teeter. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm delighted to be invited here to speak to the group, and particularly to um, get out of Chicago weather for a couple days. Not that it was so balmy here today, so much for the 50 degrees I was expecting, but that's, that's OK. Better than Chicago these days. Um, but particularly to tell you one of the really great stories in the humanities, which is the story of the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute and the uh, work of James Henry Breasted from the uh, University of Chicago. Um, I think that many of you know the Oriental Institute. How many of you have been actually inside the Oriental Institute? Oh, that's nice. You need to go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, because it's really an extraordinary place, you know, and people in Chicago sometimes take it for granted. People on campus, you know, appreciate it. Um, but it's, it's really amazing to me that I will be talking to people who have lived in Chicago all their lives, not necessarily UC people. And they'll say, well, what is the Oriental Institute? And I go, you know, it's, it's a, it's a world class, very major organization. And I want to tell you something about the origins of the Oriental Institute and the work of the Oriental Institute. So a lot of this focuses on James Henry Breasted. This is Breasted. And as one scholar has written, if one were asked to name a scholar who, above all others, stimulated the development of ancient historical studies in the US, that honor would have to fall to the colossal figure of James Henry Breasted. He was a great scholar. In fact, his, uh, his scholarly works are still used today. He was a great publicizer. This guy was a great communicator. He was not an ivory tower man, in spite of being a really tip-top, fabulous uh, scholar. He was one of the first to draw public attention to the ancient Near East, and to say that our roots of Western civilization went beyond Greece and Rome, that the roots of Western civilization actually started in the ancient Middle East. So he made Egypt and the ancient Middle East relevant to modern studies. And to back up those ideas, he wrote the school books to make sure that the information was available. He was, as I mentioned, a great communicator. He coined some really very familiar f phrases. For example, the Fertile Crescent. That was made up by Breasted. He was the first American to earn a PhD in Egyptology. He was the first to hold an academic position in Egyptology, which happened to be at the University of Chicago. 
Uh, he turned Egyptology from sort of a fringe outgrowth of biblical studies to a well-respected social science. And this was very difficult at the time he was doing this. He established one of the few comprehensive research centers for the ancient Middle East, the Oriental Institute, of course, where Assyriologists, Egyptologists, Hittitologists, people who archeologists, philologists, art historians, all study together and exchange ideas. And in fact, this vision of breasted still works today. For example, if I'm working on something and if I have a question about Hittite stuff, I go up to the third floor and talk talk to the Hittites. Um, so it's really, it is a fabulous think tank. We Now, don't laugh because the U University of Chicago's Oriental Institute has the largest concentration of Hittitologists in the world. Five. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a man, a, an idealist, really, with a vision of mankind's, an idea of how mankind rose and went from you know, the early stages, really, to the evolution of uh, to the modern man. Now, Breasted was a product of the Midwest. He was born in Rockford, Illinois in 1865 to a modest family. His father ran a hardware store. His father had a lot of problems. His hardware store was burned up in the, in the Great Chicago Fire. So Breasted studied initially for something very practical, which was a career in pharmacy. And in fact, he went to pharmacy school and received his degree. His degree. But he was urged by an aunt to study divinity and to become a priest. So at age 22, Breasted enrolled at the Congregational Institute, which later became Chicago Theological Seminary, which I'm sure some of you remember was across the street from the Oriental Institute, which is now turned into the uh, Becker Friedman Institute, kind of ironic. Um, and his main subject was Hebrew. After his graduation in 1890, he went to Yale and he met Professor William Rainey Harper, who was a tremendous influence on Breasted. Harper turned Breasted toward other ancient Middle Eastern languages. He also taught him a very good lesson that directed his future in a very fundamental way and really changed Breasted's aspirations from becoming a minister to becoming a scholar of ancient Middle Eastern texts and history. It is said um, in Breasted's own uh, well, in Charles Breasted's, his son's autobiography of his father, uh, he relates that Breasted was reading the original text of the, uh, of the Bible against the King James translation. And Breasted was horrified at the differences between these two texts, between the original text and the translated text. And that really instilled in him the desire to make accurate copies of ancient texts so that scholars could use them to write accurate histories. He was very early uh, an appreciator of junk in is junk out. If you start with in inaccurate translations, you get corrupt history. And he wrote, I could never be satisfied to preach on the basis of texts that I know to be full of mistranslation. Now, when he was at the Chicago Congregational Institute, he met Samuel Ives Curtis, who was one of the professors there. And Curtis also helped form Breasted's future uh, career. He wrote to him, you are torn because the pulpit appeals emotionally to your imaginative and somewhat dramatic temperament, but intellectually it confounds you with doubts which will only grow. You have the passion for truth which belongs to the scholar. And this was really when Breasted realized he was not going to go into the ministry and he changed tracks into Egyptology. Now in 1889, John D. Rockefeller Sr., of course, founded the or rather refounded, the University of Chicago. And as part of this whole plan, he lured Harper here away from Yale to become the first president of the University of Chicago. This was with a generous gift of $100,000 in 1889. It's a lot of money back then. And part of that was to establish an institute of Hebrew studies, which was going to be the sort of sweetener to bring, bring um, Harper away from Yale to Chicago. The next year, Rockefeller uh, donated yet another $150,000 to found the American Institute of Sacred Literature at the new University of Chicago. Now, the point of this is that the roots of the Oriental Institute are the absolute roots of the University of Chicago, because Harper was himself a biblical scholar. And so from the very, very beginning of the University of Chicago, there was a lot of emphasis on ancient Near Eastern studies, initially through the Bible, but then through more historical sources. 
So in 1890, Harper accept, accepted the offer to become the new president of the University of Chicago. And as part of the package, he brought his brother, Robert Francis Harper, who was an Assyriologist. And so some of the first appointments at the University of Chicago are in ancient Near Eastern studies. And Harper told Breasted, quote, if you go to Germany and get the best possible scientific equipment, means mentally, no matter if it takes you five years, I will give you the professorship of Egyptian at the new University of Chicago. So with this, with this series of events, the foundations of the Department of Semitic Studies at the University of Chicago was born, and the first position in Egyptology in the United States was also created specifically for Breasted. So Breasted went off to Germany. Why Germany? Well, at that time, Germany had a very, very long tradition of uh, scholarship, very long tradition of Prussian, German, Egyptology. Some of the earliest Egyptological um, uh, research was being done in Germany. And there, Breasted studied with the real greats in the field. So in 1891, Breasted was studying Hebrew, Egyptian, Latin, Coptic, and Arabic, very, very gifted uh, linguist. And I was surprised when I was doing some research recently that really very late in his career, toward the end of his life, he was still teaching classical Arabic, which was quite something to, to be that good in that language after that, after those many years of focusing on the earlier stages of Middle Eastern languages. So much of Breasted's work was in connection with the Great Berlin Dictionary. And here uh, is a, one, of, we've got hundreds of thousands of these fabulous old photographs. So this is Breasted um, with the hat um, here and his, his wife and their son who went through a many, many years with the long hair and the sailor suits. It, it was kind of difficult for him later in life. Uh, but yeah, here, he, um, the three of, of the real greats uh, of, e of Egyptian, of Egyptology in Germany, uh, George Steindorf, Adolf Ehrmann, and uh, Kurt Zeta. And studying with these men, working on the Egyptian dictionary, he, this further gave Breasted the idea of how important it was to have accurate copies of texts so you could make accurate translations of those texts. Now, in 1894, he graduated with honors. His dissertation was on the monotheistic hymns of the Amarna period. Here's the cover of it. And he was the first American to receive a PhD in Egyptology. In 1894, he returned to Chicago. Here he is with his, his wife to the left. Um, his wife was an American. Her name was Frances Hart. They had met when they were both studying in Germany. And his first assignment from Harper was in 1894-1895 to take their honey to take their honeymoon in Egypt. So Harper suggested that Breasted go to Egypt. His first trip to Egypt for his honeymoon. This is maybe not the best way to start off a marriage because obviously Breasted is going to be a little distracted, like very distracted by looking at the text while his wife is trying to focus on on the new marriage. Um, and because, yes, he had never had a chance to, uh, to uh, travel there. And Bre Harper was very clever, too, because he said, OK, take your honeymoon. And by the way, here's $500. Buy as many antiquities as you can, but bring back as much change as you can. He said, uh, re rely on the uh, generosity of the dealers. And it's very interesting, because Breasted didn't know really anything about Egyptian antiquities, obviously his first time to Egypt. And so it's fascinating to see this first group of material he brought back. It's very, very humble stuff. Some broken up shawabtis, a couple really not very nice animal mummies, um, some little sculptures, and everything. Every piaster was noted in this little tiny notebook that he kept. It was really, it's really quite charming. Um, we have the diary of his wife, Frances Breasted, from the honeymoon trip. And one entry reads, Tuesday, January 15th, 1895. We spent the day over here at the North Tombs at Tel El Amarna, I reading, and husband, as usual, copying texts. So, but, uh, and there's some wonderful stories about their honeymoon trip. Um, uh, one is uh, Breasted Recounts spending a day, he says, dickering for a day over the price of four mummies that he wanted to buy. And then he was successful in negotiating for them. He hired camels to carry them to the river where they are loaded, quote, right into our bedrooms, and we did not lose any sleep. <laughs> his, his wife was not quite as optimistic as that. Um, 
So this trip was very, very influential. It gave him his first look at Egypt. It gave him an idea of how much inscribed material there was. And so this really reinforced this idea of the importance of very, very accurate copies. And while there, he was able to again collate to, co to compare published copies of translations with the actual inscriptions in the field. And just like the comparison with the Bible, he vowed to make accurate copies of his historical inscriptions. Now, when he returned to Chicago in 1895 as the first assistant in Egyptology, he had no books, no students, very, very low salary. And he augmented it with a series of lectures all over the Midwest. And this is where he really developed his communication skills. He gave innumerable lectures to anybody that would listen, because he really needed money to support his family, but he also was very, very enthusiastic and loved just spreading the word about Egypt and Egyptology. So from this time, we can see Breasted's vision more fully formed. In 1896, he uh, wrote about a project to, quote, collect all the historical sources of ancient Egypt. This man did not make small plans. It's just incredible the way that this man thought, huge, huge ambition. And in 1899, Breasted and his wife and their son Charles went to Europe for a year on unpaid leave just for him to copy inscriptions. He spent about five years eventually in European collect in collections. And we can see from that time that Breasted was an adopter of new technology. Traditionally, people would copy inscriptions by standing in front of the inscription with a little notebook and you copy the hieroglyphs. And you be very careful to not make any mistakes. But human error always creeps in. And so Breasted did, oh, here's the sort of ship that they would have sailed on, a Dahabea. And these are some of Breasted's little copy books when he was doing hand copies. Here's uh, one from the British Museum showing his handwriting, copying inscriptions from stele and statues. But as I said, he was an early adopter of new technology. And he realized that photography was going to be key in making this plan to copy all of the historical inscriptions feasible at all. And so he started working with a 5 by 7 camera. This is Breasted's camera. We throw nothing away at the Oriental Institute. <laughs> and so he relied upon photography. He talked about, with, um, with this camera, um, you could do 20 images a day, because these are the film holders. And if you have 10 film holders, you can put two pieces of film in each. So he'd load the camera in the morning in a black bag, take it to the, take it to the museum. He could expose those 20 plates. He'd have to go back to the hotel and develop them in his hotel room before he could reload the camera and go back. But he recognized even this was a great advantage. There's a reference to 60 stele that he was going to copy. And he, he wrote, it would take me at least two and probably three weeks to copy those by hand. With the camera, I can do them in three forenoons, and the copies contain no mistakes. So back in Chicago, the museum, which became the Oriental Institute, was initially in the basement of Walker Hall. And then it moved to Cobb Hall, sort of skipped around different places in campus. And there were small exhibits like what you can see here, um, generally dominated by plaster casts of famous works. This is very typical of museums, not only Egyptology museums, but any museum during this period. But by 1894, there was an exhibit of Egyptian material, mainly the material that he brought back from the honeymoon trip. But there was an interest in the collection, both not only Breasted, but also the University of Chicago was very interested in seeing this collection grow. So in 1896, a new building. Does anybody recognize this one? This is Haskell Hall. It's on the old quad, on the west side of the old quad. So 1896, this building was endowed by Carolyn Haskell for the Semitic department, which then actually shared it with the divinity and Asiatic departments. And uh, so Haskell Hall became the, the home for this department of Semitic languages and literature. And the new, uh, actually, next time you're on campus, look, because you'll see down on this area, there are inscriptions in Greek and cuneiform, as I recall. And that's why that those are on that building, because it, it um, was for the precursor of the Oriental Institute. So these are the early exhibits in Haskell Hall, much better. Uh, by this time, uh, a lot more material, uh, both from Breasted and, as we'll see in just a moment, from other sources. But it's looking like a pretty, pretty reasonable museum by this time. 
Breasted was appointed the assistant director of the Haskell in 1896. Now, the collection grew rapidly through various means. One was Breasted occasionally going to Egypt and buying things, and also in Europe. But a lot of the material for the Egyptian collection came through the University of Chicago sponsorship of British archaeologists under Williams Flinders Petrie. Petrie is often called the father of Egyptian archaeology. He was the first to really develop a scientific method for archaeology. He was the first to realize that every little thing that comes out of the ground is important because other archaeologists, earlier archaeologists, would only keep the good-looking stuff and throw everything else away. That Breasted understood, uh, excuse me, Petrie understood that everything is part of the puzzle. Now, P uh, Petrie was incredibly prolific. He was excavating on behalf of what was called the Egypt Exploration Fund out of London. He financed his work by selling subscriptions. And so there were many museums throughout Western Europe and the United States who would fund Petrie by giving a subscription of $750 a year which was quite a bit of money at that time. But at one time, the Field Museum, the Art Institute, the University of Chicago were all subscribing to Petrie, which is where a lot of the Egyptian material in Chicago came from. Also, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, Toledo, Boston, New York, most of the museums, uh, uh, Berkeley, a lot of museums were supporting the work of Petrie. Petrie was an absolute marvel of organizations. He would excavate uh, for a number of uh, months each season. And then at this time, the laws were at the end of that season, the Egyptian government co would come and take the division, as it was called. They would take whatever they wanted for the Egyptian museums, and then they would give Petrie everything else. They'd say, this is legally yours. You take it. We have what we want. And then it's amazing he was able to do this. Then he would divide what he was given up into these lots, which then would be shipped, inventoried and shipped off to the different museums. And so a lot of the material we have at the University of Chicago is from the Petrie uh, work. And here's just one example. This is the division from uh, 18, I believe it's 1897. And some of these pieces are still major parts of our gallery. The set of canopic jars, this is in the gallery. This is one of our real treasures, uh, a Sekhmet statue. We were getting extremely fine material from these divisions. So it gives you an idea if this is perhaps one of 20 lots that Petrie was sending out, what sort of material he was being given by the Egyptian government. But the University of Chicago realized the real way to get more material and to get more evidence, do more research, was to physically go out in the field. The first field work was actually not in Egypt. There was a little tussle. Uh, between Breasted, who of course wanted the field work to be in Egypt, and Harper's brother, who wanted the work to be in Mesopotamia. Harper's brother won, and so the first season was at a site called Bismaya in Iraq, with um, led by this very colorful gentleman, um, Edward Banks, who ended up with some difficulties, you might say, with the Ottoman um, authorities over some migration of artifacts. And so that, uh, that putting it sort of nicely. Um, it, and then when Banks was booted from the University of Chicago payroll, he went into antiquities dealing. Hmm, imagine that. Um, so uh, the University of Chicago pulled the plug on this project and turned all the rest of the money over to Breasted. And so Breasted finally had funding to do his own field work. So in the meantime, Breston has these greater and greater ideas, his obsession with the need to have accurate copies of, of texts. He envisions what he's going to do is he will go and he will copy all the texts in the Nile Valley, and he will uh, have them published as 23 volumes. <coughs> so he already had this all, all figured out. Um, ultimately, five volumes appeared, which is still pretty pretty good. And in fact, I keep them on my desk. I use them all the time. They're still the... the, um, the Translations are still accurate enough that they can be cited today. So, as he wrote, I am now laying plans to copy not merely the historical, but all the inscriptions of Egypt and publish them. So, this is in 1905. So, Breasted and his wife and their son Charles head off to Egypt in 1905. And as Charles, the son, wrote, my father now entered upon another period of scientific drudgery as a self-appointed task, the importance of which he knew 
would be recognized by scarcely a dozen men in the entire scientific world. As for the general public, the meticulous recording of long known, steadily perishing, and largely unpublished historical monuments above ground had about it almost none of the excitement and fascination popularly associated with digging for buried ancient treasure. But he was more than ever convinced that however much the excavations might contribute to Egyptology, he himself could render it no greater service than to copy, while they were still legible, the historical records on the ancient monuments of Egypt. And in fact, this is the mission of our, the University of Chicago's Epigraphic Survey, which is, which was started in 1924 and is still, still six months of the year is in Egypt copying the inscriptions on the standing monuments because the erosion rate is just horrific. And so documenting those of the standing monuments. So the 1905-7 expedition, it was uh, 1905 to six and then six to seven, wonderful photography of this. This is at Abu Simbel. Here we have a very young, youthful still breasted um, between the two other major players and his son in the sailor suit on the side. And the, the logistics of this were absolutely incredible because they, uh, the first season, 1905-1906, they started at Abu Simbel, which is very far south in Egypt. I've talked to a number of people here tonight who've actually been to Abu Simbel. Um, and then they went further south to Wadi Halfa. Um, and the way they got around, here's what we call the Holy Family photograph, Breasted and his wife and Charles. <laughs> But fabulous photography. These are all glass plate negatives. These are eight by ten glass plate negatives that were carried on camelback and through boat and with boats. This is how they traveled. The, again, the logistics of this were it was like a military maneuver because they would have to leave depots of food for the for the way back. And so imagine uh, when I'll show you a photograph of the sort of camera equipment they're using. These enormous wooden cameras. Um, 500 glass plate negatives. Uh, it's just an absolutely incredible feat that they pulled off. And this really, I think, was what made Breasted such a brilliant uh, administrator later. He could do this. He could do anything. And they also, with, with the photographic system, um, they were very, very careful to not create any distortion in the photograph. So they were very careful that the glass plate was absolutely perpendicular, uh, parallel to the surface that they were going to photograph. Then they would take the glass plate down to the Nile, develop it before they moved the camera to make sure that they had a usable photograph. So we're talking about a very, very complicated process. So they reached Abu Simbel by boat. This is their, their boat, I believe, is the one on the right. And um, they spent 40 days at Abu Simbel alone. Here you can see the temple of Abu Simbel over here, the rock-cut temple of, of Ramses II. They measured, wonderful photograph. Here's Breasted on top of the statue, measuring. Here's Mrs. Breasted with her flouncy skirts and sun hat and Charles, with this ladder going up the front of the statue. They measured, they studied. Here's, uh, they took photographs. Here's the photographic setup. Very, very difficult conditions. Some of these temples were completely full of bats. They were using magnesium flash flares. Just really, really difficult. And as part of this whole system, Breasted developed a whole new system combining photography and the keenness of the human eye. Because he, he always said there is no substitute for the human eye when you're doing copying or collating, which means comparing in, uh, what's on the wall to what you're actually getting. And so the process he used was they would take the photograph. This is the photograph they would take with that large format camera. They would develop it and print it. And then Breasted would take it to that exact wall. And he would compare every single sign to make sure what was on the photograph is what was actually on the wall. So this is that process called collation. And so here you can see he's touched up the photograph where signs are not coming through very carefully, or very clearly on the photograph, but he could see with his own eye and hear notes for things that do not show up well in, in, the, in the photograph. Because part of this process was also using mirrors to bounce the light off the inscriptions different ways. So this is the way he was getting his, uh, doing a more uh, 
a more rapid but still extremely accurate copying of the inscriptions, the documenting of the inscriptions. The resulting 1,100 glass plate negatives of, from this expedition are still consulted very, very often. Some of these are absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous photographs. These are the pyramids at Meroe. Um, many of these plates are particularly important because some of the monuments that he photographed no longer exist and some of Breston's photographs are the only surviving real documents we have. So in 1906, 1907, he returned with a different crew. The first crew didn't go back the second year. Um, and um, and they, they finished up doing a lot of work at Meroe and in, in Nubia. Now, once back in Chicago, Breston con continued his frenetic pace. In 1905, the beginning of the expedition, his one of his best known books, History of Egypt, was published. And it's really one of his most famous works. It still reads very, very well today. And most history books after a century are completely sort of, you know, they're sort of artifacts. But it's amazing how much Breasted got right. It's, it was really amazing how perceptive this man was. It was a revolutionary publication at 600 pages. It was relatively short for histories of Egypt. Uh, Maspero, the great French uh, Egyptologist, his was something like six volumes long. And so this made it a much more appealing book, which was read by a wide breadth of people. It was, it was essentially like a bestseller. It was more accessible. It had good illustrations. It was very well written. It was engaging. Its emphasis was on social change rather than a parade of facts and dates and events. Now, the exercise of writing history of Egypt helped him, helped him formulate his main message, which I already mentioned, which was to make people appreciate that the roots of Western civilization are not Greece and Rome. They are in the ancient Middle East. Now, at this point, Brester was influenced by several other men, very important scholars. Uh, this is James Harvey Robinson, a professor of history at Columbia and the leading proponent of what was called new history. This idea of a whole new approach of, of uh, how one writes history. The credo of new history was progressive social change or betterment is the law of history. So this is where we're getting breasted, really treating history as social history rather than this parade of events and, and people and places. Um, as Breasted's biographer Jeffrey App notes, progressive historians had also made common cause with the sciences in their conflicts with organized religion over scientific versus biblical explanations of the world. And this is very important because it will, as we'll see, Breasted in uh, contact with uh, Robinson and, uh, and Hale, we'll talk about in just a few moments, really starts framing his discourse about ancient history in scientific terms. And what he's trying to do is take Egyptology away from being sort of mumbo jumbo um, and making it a social science. And so we'll see that he, he really uses very, what we now think is very antiquated vocabulary to make it a, a more respectable sort of study. The other person I wanted to mention is uh, George L Ellery Hale, uh, an astronomer, very, very important scholar of the early 20th century. Um, he was an adherence of what was called big science. And this is where Breasted again gets this idea of, of constructing Egyptology as a science. Hale was from a very wealthy family, very well connected. Uh, he introduced Breasted to a lot of very important people. And like Breasted, he dreamed big. Um, he uh, founded Yerkes Observatory when he was a teenager. His father built him uh, his own observatory. The observatory that's still on campus is Hale. So Hale was to give Breasted um, a lot of advice. And here's a view of Yerkes. And here you can see Breasted's influence. This is this beautiful building. And here you can see the Egyptianizing motifs over the doorway. So these two men had, were in very, very close friends. And there was a lot of sort of synergy between the two of them. So it was really Hale who gave Breasted the constant um, motivation and good advice about the plan to form a research center in Chicago at the university. So under the influence of Hale and Robinson, Breasted increasingly framed his projects in scientific language um, because he really wanted to take Egyptology away from biblical studies because it just he felt it had to be split from that, although 
Egyptology was always going to be related in some ways to Bible, but there was just too much non-scientific thinking going on in biblical studies for Rustin's taste. So this reflects really early 20th century scientific methods and advances. Um, at this time, Breston declared that, quote, the whole question of man's development can be explained scientifically. He described the development of cultures as an evolutionary rise. So this is also around the time of Darwin. This is the beginning of geology. So he's plugging all of these ideas into social sciences. He used, quote, the analogy of geological forces to explain religious development, which is all very new at this time. Now, in 1916, in the search for support for his family, Breasted was always um, looking for more sources of, of support for the family, um, and also in his effort to spread the word about the ancient Near East as the forerunner of Western civilization, he wrote this textbook called Ancient Times, A History of the Early World. He professed to hate, he hated writing this book, but it was an absolute phenom. And um, I've talked to people, some of the older people in this audience might have actually used this textbook, or some of you might remember it. It was used for, it went through several different editions. Um, and it was, a, it was a fantastic book. It was not only very heavily illustrated, which again was not common to textbooks of that time. It had study questions at the end of each chapter, also very, very unusual for that time. And wonderful charts like this. I love this barbarism to civilization. <laughs> And so he writes, I mean, he's such a great writer. We have watched the men of Europe struggling upward through thousands of years of Stone Age barbarism, while toward the end of that struggle, civilization was arising in the Orient. Then on the borders of the Orient, we saw the Stone Age Europeans of the Aegean receiving civilization from the Nile, and thus developing a wonderful civilized world of their own. And then following the Dark Age, civilization would have been lost entirely had not the Orient, when he say Orient, of course he means the Middle East, had not the Orient where it was born now preserved it. Thus enough of the civilization which the Orient and the Greeks had built up was preserved so that after a long delay, it rose again in Europe to become what we find today. So in other words, the ancient Middle East is the repository of ancient uh, culture that was then transmitted to uh, Europe. And he, he got off on some weird tangents with this, but it's, it's very interesting because this, a lot of this is motivated by these new ideas of geology and, and evolution, which he's responding to. So the book Ancient Times became a basic text in, text in schools. It introduced a whole new generation of students to the ancient Middle East, and it raised the general consciousness of ancient history and its relevance to modern day world. Um, many people commented, uh, one particular reviewer said that he had mastered the art of simplification in writing this book. And it's, he was a great, great writer. But it had another very unforeseen and very interesting impact. And this is with the Rockefellers. This is John D. Rockefeller Jr., of course, the son of Rockefeller who founded the University of Chicago. And in these days before, you know, there were movies, you know, there weren't really movies, you know, there's a little bit of radio, but, you know, people would go to lectures to entertain themselves, just like you are this evening, of course. Um, but it turns out that Mrs. Rockefeller was reading to her children every night out of ancient times. That was their bedtime reading. And she was so impressed with this book, Ancient Times, and the way that Preston was able to communicate these ideas so well and so, in such an engaging manner, she told her husband all about this, that this the guy was absolutely incredible. And so this book created the link between John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Preston, just like John D. Rockefeller Sr. and Harper had, a, had an association. So as some... Um, the younger Rockefeller and Breasted would really build a whole new research center, which of course became the Oriental Institute, which was envisioned as, quote, a laboratory for the study of man. So again, this idea of laboratories and workshops. And Breasted had said, what I could do if I could only find someone ready to invest a few thousand in my scientific work. Ultimately, Rockefeller gave him $10 million, over $10 million. And that's just to Breston and the Oriental Institute. That's not the rest of the university. These two men had a very, very close relationship. 
So Bress did wrote a proposal to John D. Rockefeller for the foundation of what would become the Oriental Institute in February 1919. And in this, it's very, very interesting. 1919, remember, it's just the end of World War I. Uh, Europe is in, you know, terrible condition. And Breasted's proposal urged that the U.S. had an obligation, that's his word, an obligation to lead because, quote, our allies in Europe are too financially exhausted by the war to take advantage of the great opportunity. And the opportunity, of course, is the Ottoman Empire, the end of the Ottoman Empire, which now he sees that you can go into those areas. Not quite right, but... Uh, but you can see this U.S. Bo boosterism also, this idea that the Americans, you know, the Americans didn't really get involved in the war. They're still standing. The Europeans, their day is gone. It's t America's time to go in and do the work. So Rockefeller responded with a letter offering him $50,000 for the establishment of a research center at the University of Chicago to be called the Oriental Institute. So there we are, 1919. Now, to the, to Breasted, the funding of this was also a vindication of American ability, about American smarts and ingenuity. Now, part of this whole first funding included reconnaissance trip through the Middle East to decide what sites the new Oriental Institute would excavate. So, 1919, 1920, Breasted, now looking considerably more mature, with um, two grad uh, three graduate students and um, William Shelton, a uh, professor at, uh, he's actually a graduate from the University of Chicago, but he was at Emory at that time. They take off for the Middle East. So they're gonna do this big scouting tour, partially to buy antiquities. At that time, it was legal to buy and export antiquities, but also just to make contacts in the Middle East. And as I mentioned, to see what areas the university should apply to for excavation. Now, Breasted thought it was a perfect time to go to the Middle East, as I mentioned, because of the end of the Ottoman Empire and the establishment of the mandates by the French and British. So if you recall from your history of World War I, so after the Ottomans go away, the French and British go in and just carve up the whole entire area. Remember, like in the pink? Pink is all the British area that they're taking over. Um, so Breasted thought, it's great. He's going to be dealing with Europeans and not with uh, more difficult foreigners. But what he did not plan for was walking directly into a war zone. Because in Egypt, Iraq, and Syria, there were huge nationalistic uprisings at this period, trying to get rid of the Europeans. Part of this, you know, it's it's so interesting when you start dealing in World War I politics, because America, if you remember uh, Wilson's 14 points, one of those points was that the countries in the Middle East should be allowed to select their own form of government after the Ottomans were gone. And so the Americans were like, big heroes to the, to the people in the Middle East. They thought Americans were like absolutely the best people in the world because the Americans were sticking up for self-determination as opposed to the British and French who came in and, and formed the mandates. So in any case, it, the trip was a lot more complicated than Breston thought it was going to be. So he started in Egypt. He could not go through um, a Sinai and the Levant because of the political situation. He had to go through Bombay and up through Mesopotamia that way and then through Syria, and throughout, there were some very, very hairy things going on, especially in Mesopotamia. They were traveling by, by horse cart. There were assassinations of the British soldiers at this time. And the thing I love about this is, look at the little American flag on a little stick. It's like, don't shoot. We're Americans. We're not British. We're not French. We're friendlies. But oh, it's this trip, it's just a horror story. There is, we did an exhibit on this a, a several years ago, and you can download the catalog for that exhibit. The exhibit is called Pioneers to the Past. All of our exhibits, you can download, all of our publications, you can download for free. But it's fascinating, the stories and the letters and stuff. It's, it was quite the, um, quite the trip. But in the course of this trip, also, Breasted made some incredibly significant purchases for the Oriental Institute. Museum, including one of our great treasures, the Sennacherib prism, dating to about roughly 700 BC. It's a clay prism about this big that is incised in cuneiform with the historical annals of King Sennacherib, including the, the, uh, the conquest of Jerusalem. It's an incredible piece that was purchased in Baghdad. And for Egyptian collection, some very, very interesting pieces here, a block statue. Notice that a lot of the material he's buying, what does it have in common? It's all inscribed, because he's a language man. He's not an art man. And here, coffin of Marisamen. So very, very important 
accessions for our museum. The mid-20s saw the results of the Rockefeller lar largesse. Um, Breasted wrote, your support and encouragement has enabled me to accomplish things for science which I had never dreamed were possible. And it wasn't just Egypt, because the Oriental Institute, of course, then went all over the Middle East. Here are the excavations at Khorsabad in 1928 to 35, which these are the, th the objects that the Iraqi government gave us from that, uh, or the excavations in the Diyala in Iraq. Here are the, the great the discovery of the fabulous statues, these statues. We have these great photographs, the moment of discovery of these statues. Um, Art History 101, you open any book and you'll see our statues in it. The excavations at Persepolis, 1930 to 1939. Um, here, one of the objects with Professor Matt Stolper. Uh, excavations, two different excavations in Turkey, in Syria, in Palestine, at Megiddo, and of course in Egypt. So in the 20s to the late to the mid-30s, the Oriental Institute had usually seven expeditions at a time going in the, each year in the Middle East. And these were enormous expeditions. There would be the scientific staff, and then there'd be, for example, 200 locals that were working just to move the dirt that the excavators were, were, um, were moving. So one of the major, one of Breasted's really uh, pet projects was the excavation of Medinet Habu, 1926 to 1933. But then, of course, the dictionary projects back in Chicago. There is the Assyrian Dictionary. This is a view of the Assyrian Dictionary Office. From It was begun in 1921, and it was finished, I think, two years ago. And this is the thing that the University of Chicago is so famous for, for long-term commitment for big scholarly projects. The University of Chicago recognizes you're not going to write a dictionary, it's an encyclopedic dictionary, of a language in five years. It doesn't happen. And then also, uh, Egypt, of course, had special emphasis in Breasted's um, heart. So the establishment of the epigraphic survey, epigraphy means copying inscriptions. This is that group that I already mentioned. Uh, based at Chicago House in Luxor that is making cop accurate copies of inscriptions as they are in danger of being eroded and view of the uh, of the staff at that time, 1924. And the headquarters called Chicago House. I know some people here have actually visited Chicago House as it originally was. Now we don't have the yard. We've got smaller and smaller yard over the years. But it, it's, it is our research uh, headquarters in the Nile Valley. Uh, started in 1924. And as I said, we're still doing work here a couple of years ago. One of our epigraphers, artists, uh, coffin text projects, Breasted was going to the uh, Egyptian Museum and copying in texts from coffins. These were published in nine volumes. And then other projects, a big project to copy inscriptions and scenes in private tombs from the Pyramid Age here, the tomb of Meraruka, this very dreamy, obviously very posed photograph of the epigraphers, and large format publications, um, fantastic publications that were, at this point, mainly funded by Rockefeller, including publications, one, Ancient Egyptian Paintings, two volumes, each one is about this big, um, and other projects as well. Then there was the project for the New Egyptian Museum. As I mentioned, Breasted did not make small plans. In 1924, he got Rockefeller to write a check for $10 million to rebuild the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, and this is what they were going to build. Um, it, this plan was presented to King, King Fuad um, and for a museum, library, research center, and offices, but the problem was there were strings attached to this, and of course, 1924, this is when the, Brit when the British are still in, in Egypt, and the Egyptians want foreigners out, or at least they want the British out. The problem was that this gift came with a string that this museum was to be controlled for 30 years by an international commission, and the Egyptians just would not have it. Uh, but some more views of it, absolutely spectacular building. It was designed by Wells Bosworth, who worked on the restoration of Versailles and Rem Cathedral. Uh, the, the, so in 1926, the offer was withdrawn, and um, Rockefeller, bless his heart, turned around and used that money to build the Rockefeller Museum in Palestine. But Breasted also convinced Rockefeller to build closer to home. Of course, the new 
headquarters for the Oriental Institute because the ha Haskell Hall was completely inundated with all of these expeditions in the field. There were thousands and thousands of artifacts that were coming back to Chicago because the laws still were at the end of each season, whether it's the Iraqi government, the Egyptian government, whatever, they come take what they want and they said, Chicago, you take everything else. And so there's just enormous numbers of artifacts coming. And so uh, the current building started in 1931. Here's Breasted laying the cornerstone and the dedication of the building. This is the current building on 58th and University. And here is Breasted in uh, 1931 uh, with representatives from the uh, Rockefeller Foundation and, of course, President Hutchins, young President Hutchins of the great books fame there. And Breasted's mission. The, the whole, this encapsulates the whole mission. This is the tympanum over the door of the Oriental Institute. So this is called, uh, this says in hieroglyphs, um, we have beheld your beauty. And so this is all the ancient world, the ancient Middle East, and this is the modern European world. And so you've got this robust Western youth. And so you've got the uh, major rulers of the Eastern world, Hammurabi, Sargon, different Thutmose of the third. O over here, you have major rulers of the Western world. You have uh, the great monuments of architecture. Here's the, the Sphinx and pyramids and Persepolis. <coughs> and here you have the Parthenon and Rem and the state capital of Nebraska building. <laughs> 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 because it was designed by the same guy who designed the Oriental Institute. Um, and of course, the, the bison being uh, compared to the to the lion. So this is really encapsulates the whole the whole thing. And so Breasted Breasted was an extremely influential, famous man. He uh, this museum was spectacular. It still is spectacular. It's gone through many different renovations. In fact, we're doing a little bit of work on it right now. Another view. He was highly respected for his scholarship and as, and as an advocate for ancient studies. He was even honored on the cover of Time magazine, which was really something quite remarkable for a social scientist at that time. After his death in 1935, the face of the Middle East really changed with new antiquities, laws, and regulations. And that slowed the flow of artifacts to Chicago. These days, nothing comes back from the Middle East other than photographs and records and data. That's fine. That's the way it should be. The image that remains today is a breasted as one of the greatest figures in the development of ancient Middle Eastern studies, a really a tireless, I mean completely tireless advocate for scholarship and learning on many different levels. There's a lasting importance of his scholarly works, 13 books that he wrote, innumerable articles. His history of Egypt is listed in Who Was Who as probably the greatest general history of pharaonic Egypt ever published. It was translated into something like seven languages, as including Braille. He was a man who really helped uh, make people think in a different way about the ancient world. Now, it's clear that it was not really a matter of Breasted being in the right place at the right time. He was a special man. He had tremendous charisma. Uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. wrote, the contributions that I have made to the Oriental Institute have been based partly on my interest in the field, which it covers, largely because of my belief in you. Clearly, your training, your experience, and your knowledge can be put to larger usefulness and with a minimum of added burden to you if additional workers and sums are made available. So Breasted was really a man whose vision and mission live on through the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute. Um, really, in all parts of the Middle East, the University of Chicago is uh, viewed as being the powerhouse of scholarship in that area. And so it's it's important to remember what contribution our University of Chicago has made to ancient Near Eastern studies. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have time. Thank you we have so time much, for, Emily. Yes. We have time for a couple. And I think because we're recording this, we'd like to have whoever's asking a question Ask it in the microphone. Is that correct? That is okay. correct. So, question: Anything you've, you know, any Egyptological question you've had, this is your chance. I'm Mac West, graduate, PhD, 1968. Uh, what is the situation with the Egyptian Museum today? I mean, we see all the political upsets. We've we've heard about uh, issues with the collections being invaded. Uh, can you tell us what the circumstances yes. are in that today? Well. 
speaking specifically about the Egyptian Museum down in Tahrir Square, the main Egyptian museum. As you know, during the revolution, people did break into the museum, and there were a fair number of objects that were that were stolen from the museum. Some of them were recovered. Not all of them were, were recovered. The museum is uh, back up and running because of its location. It's not getting as many visitors as it used to. But there's a lot of faith in that museum. I, I heard just the last couple of weeks that they are doing their repainting, their uh, relabeling. They're really making an effort to get that museum um, looking good. Now, it's, it's complicated because, of course, the economy in Egypt is not very robust, <laughs> putting it mildly. And tourism is very, you know, very reduced there. And so tourists, you know, are not contributing to the economy. I encourage you all to go. Um, but what's happening also is the Egyptians are building this new, it's called the GEM, the G-E-M, the Grand Egyptian Museum out near the pyramids. And so that is going to be an absolutely spectacular big modern museum. And as we speak, they are working on it. They're, they're pouring the concrete. Uh, they had a number of people. I've seen the preliminary plans for the installation. Um, so the Egyptian Museum in Tahrir, the original museum, it's stabilized now. Um, they're still looking for some of the, the, the missing objects. Um, there have been larger problems, actually not as well publicized, with some of the regional museums, when the security in some of these regional areas is, is really not, not good. Uh, the antiquities organization doesn't have the funding to hire guards, keep them on. And so there were two regional museums, one in Malawi and one in Tunel Gebel, which were essentially sacked. In the last during the last year, um, it's so there. There are a lot of issues with uh, security, not only with the museums, but with the storage depots where the artifacts are, are kept. So um, the Egyptians are trying very, very hard. It's um, but the Egyptian museum itself is is actually not badly affected. So is there a lot left to discover underground yet in uh, oh. Egypt? Or? Oh, that is sort of excellentio, isn't it? You know, that, that question. But yeah, I was speaking with a couple people this evening. Just when everybody thinks, oh, well, you know, we've discovered everything. In the last three months, there's been a royal tomb at Abydos of an otherwise, otherwise non unknown king that fills in a big, very interesting part of history. So it's a royal tomb. Uh, there have been several private tombs in uh, the northern part of the country. There are constantly, constantly being discoveries. And it's only the splashiest ones that actually get in the news. Um, Egyptology, you might think, is sort of a uh, fuddy-duddy kind of static uh, field, but it is not because there are continually so many new discoveries, all of this providing all new data, um, which makes us reevaluate things. We've got a whole new king. How do we get him in, into the chronologies? So, you know, we don't know what is yet to be discovered, but it's constantly, constantly things are being discovered. Even thinking about a place like um, one of the most famous monuments, it's called the Step Pyramid Enclosure of Djoser. And some of you, I think, have been there. Zillions of people, you know, you have to go there if you go to Egypt. But only about two thirds of that has been excavated. People are walking right around areas that have never been examined. So Egypt is, um, you know, it's, it's almost inexhaustible. I mean, the, the famous comment was uh, in the Valley of the Kings, just before Howard Carter took, took over. You know, Howard Carter discovered the, the king, of, uh, king Tut's tomb. The previous excavator said, I'm not going to work there anymore. Everything's been found. <laughs> and actually, since, since Tut has been discovered, uh, two, two more tombs, there's two or three, two, two more tombs have been discovered there. So it's even in the places where you'd think everything has been looked at. And what this, what I think about when I think about that is the Egyptians were so incredibly prolific. The number of monuments, the tombs, the coffins, the sculptures, the, these guys were just incredible. We are talking about 3,000 years, but it is an incredibly rich culture. You know, there's a lot of controversy about repatriating artifacts. Obviously, Breasted brought a lot of stuff back from Egypt. 
What does the Oriental Institute think about it? Is it best to keep it in Chicago? Is it best to bring it back to Egypt? What What are the thoughts on that? Well, you, you have to be very specific when you're talking about repatriation issues because groups of objects have very different issues. For example, um, our Egyptian collection, there is nothing that the Egyptians want back because it is either excavated under license with the Egyptian government and there are the export papers saying, we don't want this stuff, you can have it. Or in the case of breasted purchasing, because he was doing a lot of purchasing in the 20s and early 30s, but he would, he was very, very scrupulous. He would take whatever, he would go to the dealers. He, the regulations at that time were, you had to take everything to the Egyptian museum, present it to the board there, and then they could say, no, you know, you can take, you can export that, that, you cannot do that. So they were looking at each piece, and then there was a two and a half percent uh, tax that was levied, and after that was paid, then those objects could be legally exported. Um, but the, the laws started changing, actually, actually a lot having to do with the tomb of King Tutankhamun, because Egyptians felt really burned by that whole thing. So in our case, we are very, very careful to not get involved with things that are not entirely legal because we have expeditions that go to all these countries. And it's very interesting what's going on now is that many of the countries in the Middle East are using scholarship or the ability to, to pursue scholarship in their country as leverage to get disputed objects back. And this is very, very clever. For example, the Metropolitan, oops, not to mention any names, a major, a major museum um, <laughs> that, was ha <laughs> that was having an, uh, some big issues with Turkey. And Turkey has gotten very aggressive about going after things these days. And um, it's brilliant. They said, if you don't return those things which we can prove were exported illegally, your scholars may no, they will no longer have permits to work in Egypt, excuse me, in Turkey. And the same happened with a very famous uh, museum in Paris. Um, that the, if, with this, this is with Egypt, and they were told, and this, this is serious stuff. If their scholars are banned from working in that country, it's not worth it. You got to give the stuff back. But, but it is, you've got to be very careful to look at each, each case because the Elgin marbles, you know, that's such a rat's nest. But there are some things that are very clearly removed under, you know, under not legal circumstances. And that stuff has to go back. There's no question. But then you get into the issue of who should it go back to. In Egypt, it's pretty clear, because it's of Egyptian manufacturers who goes, goes back to Egypt. You start thinking about all of these you know, Greek pots that are found in Italy. So who do you send them back to? You send them back to Greece, you send them back to Italy. So it's a very complicated issue. But I think it's, I think it's a very good thing that's happening, is a lot of these countries um, in the Middle East, I can't speak for the rest of the world, who were kind of just um, not treated with great respect are realizing they do have some leverage. But it is important because there have been certain people, uh, very high profile people, um, who have made crazy claims. It's like, you know, uh, want the Rosetta Stone back. There is an absolutely no legal basis for the Rosetta Stone going back. Zero. So. What was lost due to the Aswan High Dam? Oh, boy. Well, the biggest problem is we don't know everything that was there, because now it's under 200 feet of water. With the Aswan uh, High Dam, uh, they were building the dam, it was in the 60s and the 70s, and all of that was actually in Egyptian Nubia. So the Egyptian government sent out an appeal for archaeologists from all over the world to come and do what is called salvage archaeology, which means you come in, you don't do beautiful archaeology, you keep records as best you can, but you just document as much as you can, as quickly as you can, because you know the water is like right behind you. So we know, for example, the uh, University of Chicago was a major part of excavations in, um, in around the uh, second cataract. And incredible material, which is now just being processed and the histories are being written about those cultures. But the tragedy is we have that amount of information, but all of that information, all that data raises additional questions. But you can't go back. You know, you cannot go back to the source. That source is destroyed. 
So it answers your question, we don't know. You know, we, pr you know, we probably have this much of, you know, a mile high of data. And this is, this is a, a very, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because this is also a, a very sort of poignant thing when talking about archeology span and archeology span in countries um, who are struggling to feed their population, they're struggling with their economic basis to balance archeology span against feeding people. It's a very, very tough, tough choice. You know, what, what do you do? And many people, when they start looking at those decisions that were made in the 60s and 70s, it's very easy to criticize those decisions. But they weren't there at the time. So, and of course, this is going on in, um, in uh, uh, Sudan. There are a whole series of dams that are being built in Sudan that is very frightening. Uh, Wendy, there's a lady in the front. I was wondering uh, how you or uh, maybe even Breasted would feel about the new uh, uh, DNA sequencing studies and how much these oh. might be adding to accuracy. Very interesting. Very. Very interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because just yesterday I was at the UC hospital uh, all day. We uh, were CAT scanning two mummies, not DNA, but CAT scanning. We got 55,000 images from these mummies. Uh, UC Medical Center. It's great. It's a testing ground for the newest CT machines. Some of these things, we're using them on mummies before they're actually licensed for clinical use. So it's like, yay, you um, see. There, there's, so CT, pretty straightforward. DNA is still very, very controversial because uh, many people say, say that um, there is something, it's not the age of the specimen from Egypt, but there's something about the chemicals in, the chemical process in the embalming the result is that the DNA sequences are very short. And so they're using, I believe this is still state of the art, they're, they're using DNA replicators to, to make longer sequences to study. And some, and, pardon me? The new techniques are getting around those. Yeah. But I, I think people are a little skeptical about some of the findings because, of course, the stuff was done on you know who, King Tut. And so, there was some concern about there should have been perhaps more uh, more people involved in the study, you know, samples sent to different labs. Um, there, so yes, there is uh, there is there are experiments with doing DNA. Uh, as far as I know, it is still only mitochondrial they can get out of the Egyptian stuff. I think so. It's especially when you want to do parentage, it's it's difficult. You can't get the male side of the family. But it's it's a project that people were working on because you know if they can make it work reliably it would be it would be fantastic. Um, I was in archaeology, classical archaeology, before I came to Chicago and went on in anthropology, and um, this was back a ways when women were not particularly welcome in archaeology. <laughs> strangely enough. And yeah. um, so I was interested in what you had to say about Mrs. Bre's Breasted, and I was also wondering at what point um, perhaps women began to get involved in, in archaeology in Egypt and whether, uh, you know, whether or when that yeah. stopped being an issue, or is it an issue? Or? Well, it's a very interesting question, because at the time I was in graduate, graduate school, it was still very unusual for there to be women in the Egyptology program. It was almost all men. Um, there was one female professor. Um, there had been um, almost no female professors of Egypt, Egyptology. I mean, like, none. And even uh, when I was in graduate school, there was, there was still a lot of what you're talking about, particularly if you they heard you're going to get married, you know, and, you know, God help you if you wanted to have children, forget it. You know, it, there was a huge amount of preference for the male, male students. But the thing that is so interesting to me is in the last, I hate to say it, what, 30 years? It has, it's completely changed. Now, somebody said, well, why is, uh, why is Egyptology such a, such a, um, a girl's discipline? I went, what? When did that happen? 
when did that, I looked around and, and it is sort of a softer, better um, uh, treatment of women. That I'm, I am delighted to see that there are, there's a whole crop of uh, young women, a lot of them who are just finishing their PhDs, who are brilliant. Uh, they are married. They have families. I don't know how they do it. You know, boy, it's really tough, but they can do it. And they're not being rubbed out of the programs anymore. They're not being discounted because they're, they're not serious. So it's very few, <laughs> very few, yeah. But but it, it is it's a remarkable transformation from the time I was in school because it was there was there was really you could feel it. There was one other graduate student who was, who was a woman and myself in this whole class of men, and we were, we were like, oh, I'm okay. Thank you. I have to ask about the kid in the sailor suit. Yeah. What happened to the son? Oh, Charles Breasted. He he ultimately became his father's secretary and stayed in the shadow of his father <coughs> his whole life. Wrote, wrote a book about his father called Pioneer to the Past. It's a great book, but it's interesting. It's ironic because, you know, his father's emphasis on, you know, accurate copies. When we started working on this other show and we started looking at the original letters that we have in our archive and how Charles Breasted was quoting him, it's like, Charles is redacting stuff, changing stuff. It's so funny. He's doing exactly what his father would not want. It's a great book, though. It's called Pioneer to the Past by Charles Breasted. Uh, you can also download that for free from, from our website. But he, he, uh, he seemed like he had a, he resigned himself to, to that role. And he, he was a person of quite a bit of influence. He spent quite a bit of time in Egypt and the Middle East on behalf of his father. The story that's even a little bit more sad is the other son, James, James Henry Breasted Jr., who decided to become an Egyptologist. It's like, I think that's a pretty tough thing to do. When your father is the most famous Egyptologist in the world, it's probably not the best idea. So he, um, he finished his degree. He wrote one book, and then he um, ended up going into muse museum administration and was actually president of the L.A. County Museum for many years. So, but it, it, you get the feeling it was difficult being kids in that family and also being a wife in that family because breasted was bigger than life. Uh oh, Dick, now softball it, okay? Uh, it'll be a soft. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, thank you very much okay. for your wonderful lecture. I have, have a question that's two pronged about museum collections. You mentioned uh, Sir William Flinders Petrie mm -hmm. uh, and how he divided up the collections or his portion of the artifacts that, that he excavated. Uh, who made that decision? Did Petrie make that? Did the museums make that, the subscribers? And the second part of that is with the all of the international laws now about uh, not having artifacts leaving Mm -hmm. the country in which they are excavated. How are museums like the OI, the Met, all the rest of the big museums getting their new artifacts, quote unquote new artifacts, but adding to their collection? And to whom do they, uh, how do they uh, get rid of the things that they don't want? Okay, I'll, let me ask, let me answer the second part. Sure. First, okay, um, because artifacts are not coming out of Egypt, um, there are, the ways you get artifacts are, we don't do this, but you can purchase things, but people who, the museums that purchase have to really, most of the museums now have whole departments for provenance research. So before the acquisitions committee of X museum will allow the curator to buy something, they've got to be absolutely certain that it is in accordance with the UNESCO um, Convention of 1970 about the transfer of cultural property. So you can buy things if you want to. We don't do that. But increasingly what we're seeing, and this makes so much sense, is museums are doing temporary loans to one another. It makes so much sense. For example, we have something like 40,000 Egyptian and Nubian objects, and we've got probably 5% of it in our galleries. Not that everything is worthy of exhibit. There's a lot of research material. But increasingly, museums are loaning material to other museums. It makes so much sense. 
It just, that's so brilliant to do that. Um, there are still th some things that come in as private gifts. People who have had objects in their, in their families for a long time. That goes through the same very rigorous provenance search because, uh, particularly for us, again, because our concern about keeping good relationships with, with the Middle East. Um, and then the, uh, the term is actually deaccessioning rather than getting rid of. <laughs> um, we, each museum has their own policy. And there are, for, for example, we basically don't deaccession. Because, for example, me as a curator of the Egyptian collection, if I say, well, I don't think this statue is really that great, or I don't think it's really real, let's deaccession it, which could be, I mean, to really deaccession means you're going to sell it. So you send it through, a, through an auction house. But we do not do that because there's a big concern with keeping the collection intact. And also, I've seen too many examples of something that was considered to be horrible by one generation and is a gem for the next generation because things are evaluated in different ways depending on the research that goes into these, into these objects. Now, what I'm seeing going on is, is pretty interesting. Some of these, these, um, the private dealers that would sell things, sell significant objects to museums. Now I notice some of these guys are acting as brokers between museums, which actually makes a lot of sense. For example, he will find out, this one particular person, that X museum is looking for a mummy with a case, you know, with a coffin. A nice. And so then he starts sniffing around other museums looking for a museum that might be interested in deaccessioning exactly that thing. And he puts those two museums together. Again, it's, it's good. It's, it's, a, it's a better way of, better way of doing it. The first part of the question was? How does, how does, uh, split the Petri oh, the, the divide. Now, I had assumed that Petri was, he, I don't, even if I know exactly how he did it, it would, it's amazing to me he was able to do it with this huge amount of material, inventorying, crating, sending. But as far as I know from our side, we never said, hey, um, Flinders, we want things that are more like this, this season. You know, we want this kind of stuff. And so we were getting what he was sending us. But it recently came to my attention that the um, Glyptotech, uh, Nikarls Glyptotech in, in Copenhagen, their curator was actually writing to, to Petrie and saying, it would be really nice if we could get something like this and something like this. And sometimes he would be able to do that. So I think it depended on the relationship between Petrie and the individual subscriber and the subscriber and how actively they were managing that kind of subscription. Because, um, for example, we did not get more inscribed things than, for example, the Field Museum or the Art Institute. You know, you'd think we might because of Breasted with his interest in inscriptions. So I think generally, unless somebody was specifically saying, I'd really like this and this, he was just trying to do equitable things. He'd put, you know, the really great stuff and he'd, you know, if there are 20 great things, each one of the 20 subscribers got one of the great things and then he would just go down that way. It's, but a huge amount of work. And what he'd usually do is once the Egyptians gave him the material, this huge mass of material, he'd take it to London and put it on exhibit to drum up more interest. And then he'd divide it and send it. But he was doing this as it would all get done within like one or two years after the stuff was excavated. Just as a corollary to that, the biggest collection of Petrie's, I think, is at the University College of London. Petrie Museum. Uh, did he give that to uh, University College London first and then divide it up? Uh, was that they got most of their stuff I'm not quite sure. There were some, Petrie also felt was, there was some bad blood between Petrie and the EEF, the group that he originally excavated for. There's some interesting story, but I don't remember it. The stuff, I think, was not originally going to go to University College London, but it ended up because of some issue. But I, I don't know. Well, thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Emily, for your wonderful, insightful presentation. And thank you all of you for sharing your time with us. Um, it's been truly gratifying to be a part of this vibrant community, and I hope you share the same sentiment. We encourage you, if you haven't done so, to visit our website, our local alumni website, www.uchicagocolorado.org. And here you can go to the directory and update your information, um, network with alums, learn about upcoming events and news from the uh, community and the university. Um, if you're not receiving our mailings via email or mail, then you may need to update your information. You can do that on the website. So also, I'd like to encourage you to visit our registration table where you can learn how to get more involved. And also, um, Emily's book, uh, Religion and Ritual in Ancient Egypt, is available for sale. So thanks again. We hope to see you soon.